Hey everybody, so today I have a, a video that I've been wanting to do for a while and that's really just to talk a little bit about my experience with airbrushing for the last three years because for those of you that have been longtime members of the channel um, you'll, you'll know that it was sort of fall of 2012 when I started doing airbrushing in the hobby um, and I'll talk about the specific products that I use and, and even talk about the, the, the two airbrushes I have experience with. Um, for those of you that might have be watching the video that, that aren't into the miniature painting and the wargaming sort of hobby and you're here to just see something about the airbrushes, just realize that um, all of my airbrushing experience is in the context of, of painting miniatures and so they're tiny sculptures and so it's a, it's a very specific application and so all of my observations are going to be geared towards that and so hopefully you know you might still find something interesting if you're interested in one of these brushes or what I have to talk about today um, and so I've been doing this for three years and I'm by no means even close to what I would consider to be advanced um, I use it as a tool um, pretty consistently for specific things and I'll and I'll talk about that in the course of the video but I don't think I've challenged myself to making the airbrush my primary um, I guess my primary mode of painting you know for small details or just you know it, it I've not pushed the envelope um, I use it for a wide number of things consistently it, it, it I am really glad that I use an airbrush but I still um, use brushes even more than an airbrush like you know for, for painting miniatures for lots of different applications and so um, what I wanted to talk about is just some of my trials and tribulations in using an airbrush some of my discoveries and aha moments that I've discovered over time um, some of these things I've seen in other people's videos occasionally people mention something very similar that I discovered but oftentimes it's far and few between. It's sort of like things you just learn on your own that nobody <laughs> kind of tells you. Um, and then, you know, if, if folks are interested in looking into this, you might just get a just a perspective from a three-year, I'll call myself vet, a three-year veteran um, in using these things. And so um, what I use today is primarily what I have used since the beginning. Um, <clears throat> the first airbrush that I actually got was a Patriot 105 by Badger. Um, it is a 105, yeah. And the next airbrush that I'd got, and not too far afterwards, and I'll tell you why, is the Posh Talon. Um, and so both of these airbrushes I would consider to be, for, the, for, for my application, um, general... They're, they're, they're dual action gravity feed, meaning they have the, the paint that goes through the cup. The dual action allows you to both control the flow of the air and how much paint. Um, and they're really general airbrushes in the sense that they're not marketed for small details. Um, you know, for, from, I guess price is really relative, but I would say they're, um, they're, they're not inexpensive airbrushes, but they're also for within this hobby not expensive airbrushes either they so they fall somewhere in the middle of uh, at least my price point um, now um, what what I would um, your experiences may be different than mine if you've been airbrushing or your experiences may be different than mine if you're heading on this venture and so just take what I say in the video with a grain of salt and and perhaps you could you know you may see similar results or you can use something that I said um, the other thing I'm kind of interested in for folks that watch the channel that have been airbrushing uh, for a while, I'm interested in whether you agree or disagree with my comments. Um, or, you know, I'm always, because I don't consider myself to be advanced, I'm always interested in learning little tips and tricks when it comes to using these things. Um, the positives for me with um, airbrushing, you know, um, I think that once you get into the upfront cost, which would be one of the negatives, is there is a significant upfront cost, you know, to get into it. Um, you can actually minimize some of the expense in ha using lots of spray cans to prime and varnish your models, depending on how, how often you go through those. An airbrush can um, save a little bit on materials, but it's, it's definitely you're probably looking at trying to achieve cost neutral like, rather than saving lots of money and getting an airbrush. Um, what I find that being able to prime my miniatures any time of the year, I live in Canada and for those of you um, 
that do lots of using aerosolized cans, you know that both humidity and temperature can really play a huge um, factor in success in your, you know, spraying your, your models and so um, with a spray can. And so being able to do it in a more of a controlled environment, either more, you know, controlled temperature for sure, like in your house, um, or um, even perhaps controlled humidity um, can really make a big difference if you're wanting no interruptions in your hobby year round. Because I, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, well, not priming today because of the weather and out in my garage, I just can't do it. And so I don't have to worry about that. That's really a benefit. I like to do lots of varnishing and I, and I don't just do varnishing at the, um, the end of finishing a model and these are the ones I use. I, I usually will mix a drop of water or so you know I fig figured out my own ratios over time but I use both gloss matte varnish for different reasons and I combine them to get sort of a satin at times as well. Um, I like to use varnishes particularly gloss varnishes throughout the the model painting process and, and it allows um, you to draw washes better into cracks and things and it allows you to go through different stages of your painting and protecting layers. If you're doing things like chipping, there's just so many reasons why I like to do that, that having the airbrush just there and being able to just put a little bit in there and at any time um, spray some varnish, um, it, it works great. I, I really like it for that. Um, base coating, of course, um, you know, as well, like it can be very good, you know, just if you're doing like one base coat first before doing other details and then uh, priming, of course, I, I like to use um, this um, polyurethane surface primer by Vallejo right, right through the airbrush um, and I find it is excellent, um, works great and it's very convenient and so um, those are very like good utility reasons for the airbrush for me um, as well you can definitely get some really nice blends as you're practicing with the airbrush that, that can be easy um, when, once you have the technical aspects of using the brush down um, to create some nice blends and you know within the miniature hobby this could be anything from making glowing swords that blend different colors it could be making jet engines glow um, it could even be just making wings on planes you know or high raised areas you know really bright versus other areas and then of course um, even when a, a technique that I use to like to use quite a bit now is to have um, do pre shading and so I'll actually pre shade a model um, prior uh, to putting the, the base paint on. I'll do the primer and then I'll, I might even use like um, either paint or a colored primer. And I guess an example would be like this. Um, I actually would pre-shade, you know, the, the sides darker and the and the top brighter, and it, it creates an effect of of being, um, you know, darker when you're getting to the base painting stage, um, which is really nice and it's very easy to do <clears throat> once you're once I like you're done with the the understanding the technical aspects of operating the airbrush and the compressor and mixing your paints. Um, negatives, I think. Um, would be upfront cost is what I talked about. I mean, initially when you're looking at doing it, I mean, depending on how you want to do it, whether you want to get a, a compressor or explore other options, I mean, you could be into this for several hundred dollars. And so that, for a lot of people, I mean, that's a big barrier that you see right away. Having said that, um, my main purchases I did in 2012, and I am still running uh, the first two brushes and my original compressor in um, 2015 going into 2016. I consider that to be pretty good because I've really now extended that initial purchase over time. And I'll, I'll talk about the specific pieces that I, I got and how they've worn and where I've had to replace some things, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes just to give you an idea. Um, the other thing is uh, there is a really big learning curve on this and I don't mean to say that to scare people because really I, I think in a lot of ways it can be very easy but in a lot of ways I was surprised as to how difficult it was in, in aspects that I wouldn't have thought. Um, I found that um, just like once you hook it up the basics of learning how to hook this up and you put paint in it and assuming that you get the paint thin to where you need to I found learning to work the mechanism and make and doing sort of basic airbrush brushing practice that they tell you to do and they have it, there's lots of resources and how to make you know circles and lines across pages and different things you can do to make you know big circles and small circles and getting used to that is not that difficult you know particularly if you're going to use this for the basics that I kind of started talking about. Um, 
that part of airbrushing is, I don't think, that hard. Um, what I found to be really hard with airbrushing was, one, to learn how to properly mix paint consistently to make it so your airbrush doesn't clog right away um, or clog and build up over time really quickly. Um, two, the, the learning on how often you need and how best to clean the airbrush um, was the other thing. and as well like both of those things can then and then I would say adjusting and learning how to use the best pressure for what you want to do with specific paint um, in some ways I found using the airbrush to be like a little bit like a puzzle in the sense that if you actually let your um, airbrush start to clog and you're not cleaning it proper, properly then you'll actually need higher pressure to achieve the same effect and in some ways if you don't know what you're doing you almost don't even realize why you're needing to do what you're needing to do like you're turning up your pressure because it's not working as well and you know it's just you're it's a bit it's a bit confusing at first um, and then finally the the, real, the realization of doing an actual restoration on the airbrush every so often and what I mean by that I don't mean sending it to like a, a factory to have it completely redone although you can do that um, I'll talk about it in a bit, but I mean using some chemicals so that you actually soak it in to actually clean the f and, and remove all traces of paint in it thoroughly um, and, and restore it to, to closer to like when you got it. It's something that I do on a regular basis actually. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, and so the maintenance and the cleaning, it can be a negative and it's a lot more work than you, um, than you might be expecting like when you go into it and but it's needed for success and also um, you may need to do it when you don't want to and what I mean by that is I often sit down and I want to paint and I want to do stuff and I have like a certain amount of time set aside to work on a project I, I can't tell you the amount of times that I went to use my airbrush and it just wasn't where I needed it at and I had to I had to clean it out and uh, or restore it um, or do something to then come back to it um, to get it to where I need it to be. Um, I guess um, damaged equipment in the process of learning how to use this is, a, is another negative. I mean it's just the, the, the you can damage everything you're using. I kind of um, I, I can let you know that like this was the first airbrush that I'd gotten and um, this is the Patriot 105 like I mentioned. I've had to um, replace the needle which is not that uncommon of a thing to need to re replace. You can bend the tip pretty easily um, <clears throat> but um, I've had to actually replace the injection mechanism that screws out of here. It's what the airline goes into and there's basically a spring pin in the top. I'm not using technical terms here, I'm just sort of using general terms, but when first learning how to use this, when I'd clogged the airbrush, I, I had gotten paint to come up into the back here and got it into the injection mechanism. And although I got it at about to about 80%, just fiddling with it and cleaning it out, I ended up really just having having to replace it. Um, and that was very much about not knowing what I was doing. And when people tell you, like, don't get the best airbrush out there because you're going to make mistakes and you know you you could ruin it and things like that, they're absolutely right. I mean. This isn't the most expensive airbrush, but it's not a hundred bucks that I just want to lose either. And I did in the in the process of learning how to airbrush make mistakes with this, and and I had to replace parts because of it. Um, having said that, I still think it is a good airbrush for general purpose use. You know, for um, scale modeling and miniature painting. Um, I ended up getting a replacement during a time when I had to send away for. Um, the injection mechanism, I had gotten um, the Posh Talon. Now, rather than getting like a more high-end um, airbrush, something that I could do even more finer details and things, I really got something that was meeting a similar niche, that's that general purpose use with the Posh Talon, but it was a different brand. And um, th this one, I would say, over time has become my main airbrush. Even though I replaced the inject me injection mechanism, they both work just fine. Um, I found the Posh Talon to uh, to be better to work with for me. I find it's more durable, and it's I find this one a little bit more refined of the two, where I find this one to be a bit more durable and heavy duty in its feel. Um, I find this one. Um, they they both can clog for sure, but I found this one easier to keep um, clean, like uh, and um, it just it hadn't clogged as often. Um, 
I do, um, overall, I like the feel. It's a bit of a weightier airbrush, too. I just, I just like it overall from that perspective. Um, one of the things that um, I really like on the, the Badger Patriot is the fact that on the back here, um, you can actually manipulate the needle like without moving this, this, this back piece, which is really just sort of a guard. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, whether this is the proper thing to do or not, and I would encourage you to watch videos on how to airbrush and use these airbrushes, and people may say not to do this, but I've found it a necessity over time when I'm work doing long airbrush sessions to be able to slightly pull on my needle to break up either tip dry or you know something that might be inside there um, like a piece of dried paint or something and and you know I don't I don't encourage you to with paint in the cup or anything to pull the needle back and get it into the business area here where, of where the air injection is system is but being able to slightly twist and or disturb that can can be enough to break a seal or you know or, or disturb like a, a clog that you have starting to develop and I really like the ability of the airbrush to do that um, and um, where what I found with the Talon is that, and I and I've heard one other person say this um, on a video in our hobby, and, and nobody else I've ever heard say it. Um, but I kind of on my own came to the same realization. You know, they had said this piece here is 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 here to be able to limit the amount of of your spray, and so you could actually like right now I can't pull it back at all, but by actually twisting the back, it just gives you the ability to set it exactly where you want your maximum. I, although that's a feature that's not uncommon in airbrushes, it's not a feature that I value very much. I, I kind of, by feel, know kind of where I want to go with that. But what it what it does is it prevents me from being able to do to, to pull back on this needle easily and do that cleaning in between going from paint to paint. I always clean my airbrush um, going from paint to paint and sometimes even when I'm doing long sessions with the same paint I do a cleaning with airbrush airbrush cleaner and um, I like to be able to manipulate that like I mentioned. So I, I will actually just completely take this off and I primarily I primarily use my Posh Talon like this this is how I primarily use it. I know I'm not the only one that does this, but um, and it, it is so I can just do this this slight twist and just control the needle here like this. Um, I would love a, a a model like this that actually just has the actual you know the the design guard on there that would allow me to manipulate it like the Patriot does. But overall, I I, I like this um, this airbrush better for sure. Um, so. Um, where else? Um, so, I guess um, one of the things I'll just mention, I'll talk a little bit about mixing paint. So, mixing paint is probably just like painting with brushes. I find that in our hobby, learning how to get paint to the right consistency is a crucial step in the process of, of learning how to paint. Um, there's nothing worse than even with a brush painting on thick paint, having it obscure your detail, having it show brush strokes just right on the model. Um, in an airbrushing, you don't get that exact effect. What happens is you clog it and no paint comes out at all. And then you can end up spending 20, 15 to 20 minutes shutting everything down, cleaning your, your, your brush, putting, mixing your paint again and putting it back in. And in, in all that time, if you have a compressor, now your compressor is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. You're putting more wear and tear on your compressor and, um, and it, it's just those things you do can contribute to success or failure in the whole process in the end. Um, you could potentially just clog things really bad and, and have um, to do either, if you don't know how to do the restoring of it that I'll talk about in a minute, I mean like some people even send their stuff back to the um, to the factory. And so mixing paint's really important. Um, I found that different paints from different companies, even I'm purely streaking, speaking about um, acrylic paint here, but these um, paints can really I guess perform differently with different mediums you add to them to thin them. Um, I'll just give you, all I'm going to say is what I use now successfully, um, <clears throat> but before I do that, I'll mention a couple of things that haven't, hasn't worked really great for me over time. A lot of people swear by using Windex um, with paint, and 
I do use Windex to a limited degree to clean um, my airbrush in between paints. Um, what I found, it's cheap, right? And, and I can just kind of pour it into there and just spray it right out um, into my um, my container, which I have what many people have, and that's just one of these guys here. It's a vented container, which is great because you're not it's not aerosolizing. But what I found is that an, a proper airbrush cleaner, um, a marketed airbrush cleaner like Spectra, which is made by Baxter, I have found dissolves acrylic paint much better and cleans even in between paint much better than Windex. And so what I'll often do is use Windex at times, um, just spray some in there, but then I'll always sort of finish with a few drops of the Spectra or I'll do one big, you know, clean with the Spectra in between um, or at the end of my airbrush session. Um, so that's sort of the cleaners. Um, but what I like to mix paint with is um, I use water and I use Liquitex Flow Aid mixed to the way it's meant to be mixed on the instructions on the bottle and I'll just use um, let's say if I'm using um, something like a Citadel paint which I find to be highly pigmented most of the time and very thick I may use one-to-one -one, um, at times with depending on the paint and you'll you'll have to experiment with a water mixture with the with the flow aid um, model color very similar I find this to be highly pigmented and also um, I'll use it mostly one to one there are times when I do some paints two to two to one paint with two paint one to water and there are times when I even go a little higher on the water if it's a really thick paint um, and then I love Vallejo model air and I can oftentimes use this straight without using any mixing um, of um, water or any other anything else but sometimes um, I do add like a drop of water to maybe three drops of paint um, I find that can change based on the color but the other thing I found is like white here that I have I go through this really fast and so I never have a problem of it getting old or anything like that or sitting around a while but I have one here um, that I bought and it's still kind of heavy like it's 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 not been um, thoroughly uh, used I bought this like three years ago and I find now even when I shake it up and I and I, and I put some out that it it's actually starting to thicken over time and so in those cases you know I, I as I start to see that and I can see how thick it is compared to some of the other ones I'll actually start adding water with the Liquitex flow aid now there are um, videos that talk about using matte medium by Liquitex with the paint and using more matte medium actually um, than, than um, what, what I should say is they use a ratio of Liquitex Flow Aid in the, in the water combination I just talked about with matte medium and the paint. Now this is acrylic medium and so it's meant to really just be that stuff that's in paint um, just without the pigment and so you're sort of thinning it down but also keeping it at a um, you know, a nice flow paint consistency, but you're not disrupting the paint, uh, you know, particles that, that are in there. Whereas if you, I think the theory is, and I think it is true, that if you add lots of water to paint, you start, you can start to disrupt it to the point where it's not consistently um, dispersed among um, the liquid, you know, that, it, that it's in, you know, the, the, the portion of liquid that it's in. Now, um, I don't know exactly how flow aid works. I believe it's a surfactant, um, but it I find it works great. It makes paint flow really well and hold together really well. Um, this matte medium, although I, I've had times where I've had success with it in the combination that people talk about often on YouTube and, and really experienced painters at times will talk about it, but in the end what I found is that just this, this flow aid along with water really works the best for me. Like I, I just avoid the um, the matte medium altogether in the airbrush. I found just this thins it enough and keeps it consistent and um, I don't need the matte medium. It just becomes an extra step and at times I find it can thicken things almost more. It doesn't thin it enough because that the whole idea is to get a really sort of people often use the phrase milky. I think it's a little controversial but that sort of milky consistency um, where you're seeing the paint you know 
flow down your cup and your airbrush and, and you know you can see the but you can still see the film of pigment and it's and, and even when it's thin you know it's not um, sort of breaking into a a double layer of water or your your medium and the paint and so those are that's kind of how I use these these are primarily the paints that I use um, yeah and so that's pretty much um, what I wanted to talk about as far as with paint um, I talked a little bit already for cleaning about the um, using the Spectra versus using the Windex. I never use just pure water to clean. But what I didn't talk about is the restoration in detail. And now, I apologize, I don't have the bottle in front of me. I'll show a picture of the Createx um, Airbrush Restorer. And this is just a, like a, it's sort of a canning jar that I just found in my house. I use this um, because I use that, that Restorer over and over. I've seen some people just put drops of it into their airbrush and let it sit for a bit and spray it out um, and it takes the paint with it. I basically take my brush apart and I immerse it and put it in here. Now I don't put the injection piece in there but I put the majority of the of the parts. Um, I don't put the needle in either. You know I, I basically clean the, need, the needle separately. Um, but this stuff works amazing. Um, it, it makes an airbrush almost work like new by just letting it sit in there for 24 hours. Now it is um, you know, I guess it's volatile, and so you don't, you know, you basically w want to um, keep it closed. When I when I take my airbrush out, I put latex gloves on, and I, I usually take a cotton um, Q-tip, and I wipe it all down. Um, I often will have to, with a, um, a Q-tip, I'll have to pull um, paint. If I had paint in there, oftentimes I'll be putting the Q-tip in the airbrush and, and just pulling out. It just basically turns the paint into just instead of a dried clump of something in there, it basically, basically makes it extremely wet and just run off anything that touches it. And so it's just amazing in, in um, how it allows you to clean it. And you can put regular airbrush cleaner or, or water um, through here and just to, to clean it out as well, just using the pressure of your, your air supply to, um, to just basically clean everything that was in there out. Um, but it was a godsend, so I would honestly recommend anybody that gets an airbrush use um, an airbrush restorer on occasion um, and particularly if you're having trouble in the beginning and you get a major clot and it just seems to be all you know backed up like you know use that and it will really really save you a lot of time and, and, and heartache and energy um, so um, I guess uh, the last thing, I know this isn't all comprehensive, but I guess one of the last things I just did want to mention is um, my, I did a video in October of 2012, you know, around the time when I just started airbrushing, and I was brand new to it, and I'll put a link below to it if you're interested, because this is just sort of when I started, and it was on my setup, but it really focused on the Posh D3000 um, our compressor. Now that compressor is still going, the one I have in the video, and is the one I still use to this day. In that respect, I think it, it's a great little compressor. Um, it was a, a pretty nice price point that I would got it at. Um, the only thing that's changed since first starting it is um, it no longer has an auto shut off, so when it gets to a certain pressure point, you're just shutting off. That just mysteriously stopped working at one point, over four years. And then, um, lastly, I mean, it, it works harder than it did before to achieve the same pressures. And it has no problem now in um, four years later maintaining 20 to 30 PSI. Um, and that's, you know, I, I often paint around 20 PSI for the applications I'm using, and, and it has no problem with that. Um, but it, it used to go much higher and much easier and in a lot of ways I see it as a bit of an old car you know if you ever had an old car where you've been running it for a long time many many years granted this is only four you know not 15 or something but um, it, it's starting to age you know like it's been used quite a bit over that time it's it is an oilless piston mechanism and so it generates heat um, and you know that's why um, with this, you wouldn't want to be painting for hours using an airbrush compressor, a, D, a, a Posh a D3000R, because it's going to get hot. And like I, I find that um, after a half hour of solid airbrushing, I usually like to let it 
cooldown. Um, and when I say solid, I mean I still shut it off um, intermittently throughout that process. But when I'm going most of the time for 30 to 45 minutes, like I am starting to look at stopping pretty soon and either doing it later in the day or the next day. Um, and so, you, you know, you're, I'm not going to be running it all the time. And so um, take that for what you will. If you have any specific questions about any of the airbrushes or the products I've talked about or the compressor, I'm happy to answer them. And I'm really interested in learning about other folks and how they're doing and whether they've come to some of the same conclusions. I find that um, this is one of those subjects that there are a lot of experts like on YouTube and in, in our hobby that and there are people that know much more than me but there are also a lot of folks that just have different conclusions and outcomes and disagree with a lot of things and, and, and just it's airbrushing can be a very controversial subject even whether we should be doing it in our hobbies some, sometimes discussed really really far in depth and so having said that like I'm, I'm still and because of it I think a lot of people shy away from talking about this stuff in detail sometimes I would really like to hear about people's you know experiences whether they're similar to mine you know whether they um, maybe used to do something I do and said until I started learn this and I can improve maybe learn something and do something differently myself so um, hope this was helpful to folks particularly if you're not into airbrushing and considering it. Um, overall, I would say despite all the challenges that I've had, I am really glad that I started airbrushing. Um, it helps in so many ways. It's really fun to do airbrushing effects, but then as well, um, even more importantly, I just find it to be an awesome tool um, to make life easier in the hobby. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't regret it one bit. Okay, everybody. Hope you found it helpful. Take care.